Exposure again. I am Stan Emmert, and we are very fortunate to have Michael Young with us, a, com a commodity and futures broker and trader. And this is segment three of this interview, so you're going to want to see one and two. But segment three, we're going to start with Glass-Steagall. You mentioned it in segment two. Right. For those who don't know what it is, what is it? Glass-Steagall was an act passed from the Depression era that separated commercial banking from investment banking. What happened in the 1920s, the go-go era of the 20s, is that the commercial banks and the investment banks were the same. So they were taking in public money and deposits, and they were speculating in Wall Street and elsewhere, Europe, with the public's deposits. And of course, what happened was 1929, and the speculation came to an end, and the banks were all broke and had to be bailed out again by the government. So the people in Washington said, enough's enough. We're never going to again let you put commercial banking and investment banking into the same companies. It's just not healthy. And we didn't have that from 1934, I believe, or whenever mm -hmm. the last Eagle was recently passed, until it was repealed in the mid-90s. And it was the biggest mistake ever made by this country. Hmm. Michael, you're in the futures business. Right. You're in the same business as the people at Wall Street. You just don't happen to be there, right? Well, we, our business is transactional. I mean, we trade futures for our own account, which means we have to make a judgment whether uh, the Deutsche Mark is, or excuse me, the euro is a good, a good investment or the British pound sterling is a good sale or the bonds are reasonably priced in the treasury market. Those are the kind of decisions we make. We don't, we don't do over-the-counter derivatives. We don't see. create exotic and credit default swaps? Credit default swaps. You don't create the kind of things. things that are traded over the counter that the banks don't want to have transparency or margin correctly because they make too much money in by deceiving their customers who are buying them that they're valuable or have value. Now, when you say banks, you're you're not talking about the bank down the street. You're talking about... I'm talking about the banks in New York, the city banks, the Chase Manhattans of the world, who basically have designed these these uh, products that are supposed to do something for someone, but what they really only do is steal and give money to the New York banks. Okay. Are they stealing from Europe? And is Europe important to us? And, and here's why I say this, because uh, we've got uh, just actually from today, as we do this on November the 4th, there's a, an article in the USA Today. It says the G20 leaders say Europe's problems are your own problems. And here's a quote. Uh, a few minor steps to promote growth and financial stability were agreed upon, but the outcome will do little to calm markets or redress the debts and imbalances that continue to threaten stability and growth. This was a quote from Charles uh, Kupchan of the Council on Foreign Relations. Is he right, and do we care? We should care, because Europe is a huge trading partner of America, and, and it's not an area of the world that we need to see uh, go into recession or depression. The problem we have in Europe is um, manifest by what happened by the Maastricht Treaty, which basically put Europe all under one currency. So if you lived in Italy, you didn't trade, you didn't have your lira anymore, you had euros. Mm -hmm. If you lived in France, you had euros, Germany had euros, uh, Greece had euros, Spain had euros, Portugal had euros. What this did was, was it allowed manufacturers that had historically had problems selling product into places like Greece because of the currency translation, that was now smooth. There was no more problem in selling a Mercedes automobile in, in Athens because you got paid in euros. And so... There was a tremendous boom to the manufacturing uh, countries in Europe that manufactured um, automobiles and washing machines, the things people use every day. And the manufacturing countries are? Basically Germany, Sweden, France. Okay. The people who used the products were basically Spain, Italy, Greece, uh, Portugal, Ireland. Now, the problem was, was that nothing had changed in these underlying economies. They turned their currencies over and we're now using euros, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. How do you think the gap between incomes in those countries to buy the new goods and services coming from Germany, how do you think they did that? Mm. No, they did it off the backs of, the, of those they, who were purchasing, no, right? They did it with debt. Oh, they did it with debt. Oh, okay. What they did was they were able to they were able to print up enough bonds and sell them in the world markets so that they could finance the gap between the intrinsic value of the of the Greek drachma mm -hmm. and the real value of the euro being sold as the medium of exchange. So over time, while this trade process went on, mountains and mountains and mountains of debt continued to accumulate, and nobody, I mean, who would want to stop the, this great standard of living that was rising? No one. Yeah. The only problem is, is at the end of the road, you're, you're left with mountains and mountains of debt. Now, who, who did the mountains of debt? Who was the biggest 
who did the most underwriting of these Greek bonds and things. And the other thing, in the master treaty that was supposed to be, there was a percentage of debt to GDP that you couldn't exceed. But the, the shrewd investment bankers at Goldman Sachs, can you believe this, found a way around that percentage by creating derivative instruments that didn't quite meet the definition, thereby allowing the Greek government to go deeper and deeper into debt. Yeah, actually, that was what I was going to mention. There was a, an article out of the New York Times in uh, February 2010, which saying a deal created by Goldman Sachs helped obscure billions in debt from the budget overseers that's, that's correct. in Brussels. When I think of Greece, I think of this incredible scenery, but now I'm going to think about a very, very well, poorly run country. And now they're down to the point where, you know, the IMF and the, and the people that run the IMF and the people that run the European Union are saying to them, okay, we'll give you another tranche of money so you can pay us back. It's like, okay, if you starve a little longer now, if you're willing to eat like only three times a week, we'll give you another eight billion so you can pay us back. Well, eventually, <laughs> the people of Greece are going to say no. And that's essentially what they're saying. And, that's been, and I think we're basically getting down to that. Isn't Italy next? And won't well, Italy be worse? It, it's hard to know because you don't, you really don't know. There's been some studies done that said that if Italy really did go into a default mode, it would be on a scale compared to the Lehman defaults, it would be eight times the level of that in the world marketplace. Wow. But the problem is, is that that may not happen. I mean, these are resilient deep markets. These are sovereign debt markets. So there's a very good chance that you can continue to issue debt or maybe restructure debt. Mm -hmm. however you want to term it over time, that would not put us into that situation. Michael, an important part of business is to be able to exist in the world. It's not just, it's not something that exists in a vacuum. Every single time we talk about bad actors, Goldman Sachs comes up and they're a U.S. firm. Yeah, uh, it's unfortunate. I, I think they're... I, I think something has happened. When I first got in the business, I started with a firm out of San Francisco called Dean Witter and Company, mm -hmm. and I was trained by them. In those days, we went through broker training, and I spent a year in San Francisco at the corporate headquarters going through training. And there was a different culture in those days, Stan. When I came out, the point of our firm was to make our clients money, was to take care of our clients above all else. Something changed along the way. Now the motive is how can we use our clients' money to make the most money for ourselves? Hmm. And, that, and that motive uh, is, is driving, I think, a lot of the problems you see in, uh, among major firms, uh, particularly the New York banks right now. So with that, Michael, we're going to be going to the next segment because what we're going to do is we're going to talk about how we can fix all of this. So I'm Stan Emmers with Public Exposure. Michael Young, who is a futures trader and broker, is with us. Be sure to watch one, two, and three, and we're coming back with four right after this.